assemblies. Assembly is a unit of execution, the DLL or EXE. There's three entry points, which means the three different things that can actually be executed. So there's Win Main, which is for uh, like Windows applications. There's a DLL main for DLLs, of course. And then there's main for console applications. Assembly forms a security boundary. Permissions that are, or requests are granted to an assembly. Okay. So um, there's lots of other things involved. Assembly forms a type boundary. So basically an assembly encapsulates all the types you have written. All types are encapsulated inside of an assembly. Assembly forms a reference boundary. Uh, resources can be private or exposed from the assembly. So meaning somebody was saying common code, most everything should be common so it can be reused. And it forms a boundary on top of your types that meaning code can be either exported through the assembly, meaning other people can use it or not. An assembly forms a versioning boundary. Microsoft has a different way of versioning things. It's not the file version you guys are used to. It's really more involved. It's a unit for sharing, of course. That's what we share is assemblies, right? That's what we give to people to run our applications and hopefully make money. That's what we use for deployment and assembly is deployed. Assembly is uh, loaded on demand. If there's code in assembly, never gets called. If that code it references another DLL or assembly, you don't even need to ship it. In the old days, if you referenced some, anything, it would have to be on the machine or guess what? Your program takes an entire dive. In .NET, it doesn't work like that. Everything's loaded on demand and you can actually run different versions of the same code side by side with the um, GAC and true.NET versioning. Uh, that's totally possible, not that I've seen a lot of people do it. And you can run multiple versions at the same time. All assemblies consist of four elements most of the time, okay? And we're actually gonna look at these in Linux demo. It contains a manifest, which basically self-describes the assembly. So anybody can look at this manifest. It contains the type metadata, which is the information about the types that are encapsulated inside the assembly. It includes the IL or MSIL, which is the compiled code uh, that your compiler does. And also contains all your resources too. Like I keep saying, strings, icons, media, files, and things like that. You can embed up in your assembly, right? So this is what a single module assembly looks like in .NET. There actually is a multi-module assembly, which I've never seen anybody do. Every assembly has an assembly module, which if you come from VB6 days, uh, it's not a VB module, okay? It's an assembly module, it's different. The first thing in the assembly, which you're actually gonna see, is the assembly manifest. Uh, which, like I said, makes an assembly self-describing, which is you come from the older way of COM way of programming. It's kind of like type library. We also have a module manifest. So there's an assembly manifest and a module manifest. And then, of course, your assembly contains all of your types, which are the classes you've written or exposed or whatever. Your resources, which you talked about, user-defined types, which are called structures. Manifest contains the assembly name, the version number, the culture information, and the strong name information, which is the digital signature, which comprises uh, the .NET version of an assembly. This is how it, you can have two assemblies named the exact same thing, but if you change just one of these things, it's a completely different version and can run in the GAC side by side with the old version. This is a true versioning in .NET because it can't not be duplicated. It contains all the files in the assembly, the reference information, and information on uh, resourced uh, outside uh, things that the assembly uses, which you're gonna see in the demo. So this is the demo. This is a, a program that comes with the SDK called ILDASM, which we're gonna look inside the assembly manifest. Uh, you can search for it, it's the easiest way I find it. And I'm actually gonna look at my open source assembly, which you can get off codeplex.com. And when you bring it up, the first thing it says right up here in your assembly is the manifest. So that's what we're gonna take a look about at first. So the very first thing at the top of your manifest is actually the external calls it's doing to the Windows APIs are right here, very top. So anybody looking at this knows exactly what Windows API uh, DLLs it's calling. It also has a, uh, a public key token, the MS Core library, which is the system library in .NET. And here's all of this stuff that uh, I'm using from my assembly. So you can you see here system.core, System.xml, system.web, system.webforms, system.web.services. It's all this stuff I'm using inside my assembly. This is the uh, product uh, attribute. So the assembly, a lot of the information inside the assembly itself, uh, we use attribute. There's also other attributes like CLS compliant attribute, which makes sure your assembly can be called by any other .NET language. There's the assembly description, which tells people a longer description of your assembly. 
that's in the manifest. This is actually the location of all your resources right here. This is where it says resources.resources. And here's some other uh, resources default graphics that I have. This is the location in the assembly of that stuff. And this is the actual assembly, uh, the module manifest. So also with ILDASM, uh, you can go in and look at everything inside my assembly. These are all my namespaces, which we'll be talking about later about namespaces. But I can double click on one of these. Come on, I'm trying to find one I want to show you. Here's all my methods inside my um, class. This is my .NET Tips Utility .Computer Helper class. Show you the IL code. There you go. <laughs> so this is what everything and all the compilers in .NET language compilers compile to. It's this IL code, and this is what gets translated into machine code. In .NET, we've kind of done a uh, a loop back to the Windows 3.0 and 3, Windows 3.1 way of uh, distributing applications. Back in the Windows 3.1 days, those of you who are probably not even born then, no I'm kidding. We basically, you know, had our program directory, which is not in program files. I forget what it was back then. And everything that program used went in the same directory. Life was grand. We hardly got any calls and support, you know, everything worked. Uh, and in .NET, this is actually what we, and I'll tell you what happened next. But this is .NET, this is actually what we recommend you doing in 99.99% .99 of the cases in your deployment. Um, it actually does offer versioning because versioning can work either a private or a public assembly, it doesn't really matter, this isn't really true anymore. The same directory as the application or the slash bin directory, right? So you can put your exe in the application directory and do the slash bin, it'll automatically find it. And then Microsoft came out with Windows 95 and said, no, that's not the good way to do it. We should share our code. We're gonna make this directory called System32. That's where all the common shit goes. They said, screw that. Well, now we want you to put everything in the Windows 30, the System32 directory, Windows slash System32, right? That's where we want you to put everything now. And to manage it, we're gonna create this brand new piece of crapola called the registration database. That's when everything went to crap. That's when DLL hell started. That's when we hired a lot more tech support people and to keep them in a job because you couldn't register two versions of the same DLL in the same, in the in Windows. Even if you came out with a different version, either you had to get it off the system. Why does this suck? Well, because I put out my application and it uses, uses SQL driver 2.0. So if some other company comes along, SQL driver DLL version one, it gets installed in the system 32. The registration gets redone in the registration database now your application runs and it was relying on 2.0 code and dies. And you get the support call, not the idiot who improperly installed the program because of DLL hell. That was our hell until .NET came. Microsoft kind of did a turnaround and go, okay, never mind. <laughs> and let's go back to the old way. No registration database. Microsoft.NET does not use the registration database, period. Right? You can use it if you want to, but I highly recommend not using it. So, but we still need shared assemblies. We still need the capability or the dream of the System32, which didn't work. We still have the capability of doing that with what we call shared assemblies, which are in, in reality are absolutely no different than private assemblies, except for one thing. And that is a truly versioned .NET application, which meaning it has those four things I showed you. That's a truly versioned .NET. And that's the only difference between a private and shared assembly, only different. So it offers all these things, versioning, you know, side by side. And the way all this works is there's a special directory, Windows now called uh, assemblies, and that's the GAC. 99.9999% of the component, the DLL uh, assemblies I've written have not done this because of the DLL hell. When you do those four things, it's what we call a strong named assembly, right? And that's a requirement to go into the GAC the global assembly cache, which is the .NET version of the system 32. The other reason we do strong name is to prevent something we call spoofing. I recommend in my coding standards talk, and, and I've forced my work to do it, is we strong name everything. And we never put it in the GAC. We do it for that one reason. And this is kind of what the global assembly cache looks like. 